Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The text this day is taken from the Holy Gospel reading where our Lord speaks to us about the last day, the end time, in terms of five wise and five foolish virgins. This is the text. In the name of Jesus, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ on more than one occasion wanted to make His disciples and all who would hear aware of a return. Of a return that you and I often referred to as the last day, His second coming, sometimes people say, His final return, the day of judgment, I don't know. It comes by various, various names. And it's fitting that the last Sundays of the church year, we talk a little bit about that. I would guess, even though I wasn't here last Sunday, that you heard a sermon, something to do with the end times. Isn't that true? And this Sunday being the very last Sunday of the church year, what would you expect? But something about the coming again of our Lord. Interesting that the church year doesn't really follow the rest of the world, or at least the rest of America. We have our own way of doing things, and thanks be to God for that. But uh, this today is sort of, so to speak, the church's New Year's Eve. And next Sunday, the first Sunday in Advent, the church ushers in the new year of our Lord. But what are you and I to make of the account of the five foolish and the five wise virgins? And what does it have to do with our Lord's coming again? And what does it have to do with you and me today? Well, our Lord wants you and me to know that His coming again will come suddenly at a time that you and I are not aware of. I don't know about you, but as I think about the text before us, in modern day terms, I would think that this bridegroom maybe isn't the wisest bridegroom to catch his bride off guard, so to speak. Maybe at first glance we think to ourselves, well, what kind of groom, and the term here is bridegroom, but it's the same term that we use for simply groom, bridegroom, groom. What was he thinking coming at a time when his bride was not ready? But that's not really the truth. If you look carefully at the text, the bride was ready. And there were those who entered along with the groom into the festal hall for the great banquet celebration. So even though it was at a time that was sudden, even though it was at a time that was unknown, the bride that is the five wise virgins were indeed prepared, were indeed ready for this coming of her groom. There were those five in number who were also foolish. A close look at the Greek text actually calls them moronic virgins. But we'll settle for foolish today. The five foolish ones. And as you consider the text, what was it that was different about the foolish virgins? Well, interestingly, there's lots of similarities. I mean, they were all called virgins. They were all supposedly in some sort of expectation of the bridegroom. 
They all had lamps, but at least in the way the Lord wants us to understand this parable, the foolish did not have oil. A way of saying that they were unprepared for the coming of Christ. And that is the best way to understand that. That while the Lord had given His warning and His promise that He would return in an hour unknown, and that they were to be prepared by having oil in, their, in an extra flask ready to be used in a lamp, some pay no attention to that. They didn't care whether or not they had the oil or not. While the five wise virgins had plenty of oil, and when the Lord came again, they were indeed prepared for His coming. Sometimes we do ourselves a disservice to try to get into a point-by-point -point spiritual comparison in these kinds of proverbial texts. But I will stand with Luther and others who understood that this oil would be best understood as a gift of faith. That the wise virgins were those who had by grace freely received the gift of oil, or let's call it the gift of faith. That in that way, they were prepared at any time for the Lord's coming again. But the foolish, the foolish had no faith. They did not fear and love and trust in the coming bridegroom. No, not at all. And so that separates them as foolish rather than the wise. Now you and I know from the rest of Holy Scripture about faith, don't we? That faith is that which comes by grace, not as a gift that is, has to be earned. Well, I guess it's not really a gift if you have to earn it, is it? that which you pay for of your own accord, that you have to do something to receive, to get that gift. No, 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 that's not the way our Lord Jesus Christ talks about faith at all. But rather you and I are to understand the gift of faith as a gift that's given according to Christ's command. Paul says in Romans 10 verse 17, what? Faith comes by hearing hearing the word of Christ. Or, to use the parable here, faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of the bridegroom. That's how it comes. So that faith is given as a free gift. And not only is it given as a free gift, but the Lord Jesus Christ has declared to His church, you and me and indeed the entire world, where you and I might know where to find this faith. It isn't difficult to find. The gift of faith is found where the Word of God is. Where the Word of God is being faithfully preached and taught and known. That's where this oil of gladness, this oil of faith is to be found. It is found where that word also connected with such things as water. And that's what makes the gift the gift in baptism, right? Where faith is bestowed, not simply because it's plain water or some sort of magical abracadabra, no, nothing like that, but rather where the word of God is connected to water, there God makes all sorts of promises, including the bestowal of the gift of faith. We know that, and we are blessed to have known that and received that. We also know that where that Word of God is connected with wine, 
grape wine. And where it is connected with bread. That there, God wishes to do something for us. Not because it's bread, not because it's wine, not because it sits on that altar or over there in the corner or someplace else, but because it is given along with Christ's word of institution and promise. If the word of God is not spoken there, then we have no need of it. We can have it or we can leave it. But when God's word is joined there, oh my. There in light of this text, God's busy pouring his oil out upon you. That's right. Or as I think about the text, the 23rd Psalm, that He fills our cup, not just a little bit or not just enough, but He fills it up so that it's overflowing. Yeah. That's right. I can remember as a kid thinking, well, if I come in at the beginning of the church service and the pastor speaks Christ's word to me and says, in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, I forgive you all of your sins. And I say, Amen. I have received the forgiveness of sins. That ought to be enough. Can I go home now, Mom and Dad? I've received the forgiveness of sins, haven't I? I was talking like a foolish virgin, wasn't I? That's right. Christ would come to you this day under these circumstances, whether this room is full of people just brustling over with people, whether they be young or old or infirmed or full of life and energy, that God lavishes you with the gift of faith this day. That you might be filled up unto being a wise, a wise virgin. This wisdom doesn't come in any other way. When we try to seek out God's gift of faith his gift of grace in other ways, we are foolish virgins. We are. Our sinful nature is prone to be like foolish virgins. Wanting just enough, not anymore. Looking for God's grace where it isn't to be found. Trying to find the bridegroom in places where we've been told he is not. And yet we look and we see, don't we? How often, how often you and I have seemed not like wise virgins at all, enjoying the oil of gladness, the oil of His Word, trusting in His words of promises, but rather doubting them, being foolish ones. Dare I say moronic? Yes, it's true. And therefore the law and the gospel must be proclaimed in parishes throughout the Lutheran Church, Missouri Senate, in parishes throughout, God help us, in all Christian congregations throughout the world. Because this suddenness of the return of the bridegroom calls us to be those who are prepared, those who are looking anxiously, looking often in hopeful anticipation, not in sleepiness, not in dreariness, not in who caresedness, no, none of that but rather where God has given to us His promise, you and I who are the wise virgins rejoice to find there all of the grace that God gives to us. He wishes to lavish us in this oil of gladness. It also must be preached among us because as Luther preaches this text, and I tend to agree with him, he talks about these foolish ones who are oftentimes people who show up and sit in pews on Sunday morning. 
that we cannot be certain, only God knows, that where that word of God goes forth and pierces beyond the ears and the mind to the very stony heart and crushes it and recreates there a new fleshly heart, as the prophets speak. That is a heart of faith, sincere, simple belief and trust in the Savior. But sometimes there are those among us who that word just sort of boings off the forehead and doesn't go any further. That the word of God must be preached among us, even among preachers. Have you not read in the Holy Scriptures a number of times that preachers, the one who stands in pulpits and put on nice clothes and clerical collars, that oftentimes we are warned of them? as false prophets, as pseudo-prophets. Why? Because they come not to give you oil. That is, they do not come in the stead and by the command of the bridegroom, declaring to you the word of God, that you might be filled up with the oil of faith. But rather they see those ears itching and they put their finger in there, so to speak, and they say what you want to hear, even though it not be that oil of gladness. God save us from those kinds of preachers. And God humble preachers who would dare to stand in the stead and by the command of Christ and proclaim His word, that they might not only be sincere, but that they might faithfully preach the text, not their own imaginations. That they be willing to proclaim that law of God, even though it comes upon a congregation at times unpleasantly. Pastor, couldn't you have taken a little easier on us this morning? But dear God wishes to speak to you in that way. Not to simply crush you or to make you feel horrible. But His holy law comes upon us so that we might be made ready for that oil of gladness. That we would take our eyes off of the pleasantries of this world. That when Christ comes, we, oh, here comes the Christ, but I'd rather cling to my earthly possessions and be here. Why does it have to change? Oh no, but that word of God would show us that there will be a new heavens and a new earth. Even as the prophet Isaiah in the 65th chapter speaks this morning, Behold, I declare to you, I will create a new heaven and a new earth. Which is to say that when this groom comes again, this Jesus Things as we know it will no longer be that way. A passing away, a death, so to speak, of fallen creation. Creation that has been disturbed horrifically by the assaults of sin. That not only earth, but the stars and all the universe, Isaiah says, will melt away, go away. And in its place, a new heavens and a new earth. Prepared for those with faith. Prepared for you and for me. Prepared in such a way that you and I are to imagine it by faith as a great festal banquet. Not as a day to be afraid of. Not as a day to worry about, as if, oh no, will I stand worthy on that day? Dear Christian, if you think that way about the coming again of Christ, look here to your baptism and be encouraged. That Christ Himself has marked you as one redeemed, the cross upon your forehead, a cross upon your breast, the water splashed upon you with the mighty Word of God, there cling to that grace, that oil of gladness. And if this week has so drained you of that flask of oil that you feel weary 
and wonder about your own salvation, then guess what? Dear friends, you've come to the right place. For God in Christ wishes, wishes to preach into your ears and into your heart the oil of gladness that is of faith that you and I enjoy already today a foretaste of that wedding banquet. And you know where I'm talking about, don't you? As you gather here before this altar, God feeds you the body and blood of Christ, the bridegroom. The bridegroom filling up his bride. You opening your mouths and receiving what God gives you by faith. Amen, you say. That is, that what God gives to you, you hold and you grasp by faith alone. In this way, you and I are encouraged, encouraged even today that we might be filled with the gladness that you and I will know for a fact on that last day. But we enjoy even already as a small foretaste of the big, beautiful banquet to come. In the name of Jesus, amen. Please rise, we confess together the Nicene Creed.